What's going on everybody and welcome back to Comic Breakdown. If you guys are new to the channel, do me a favor and hit that sub button. Hit that notification bell, make sure you're not missing any of the awesome content we have coming out. And with this video, we're going to be jumping into the Darkhold. This is going to be the Alpha Issue. And we have a story that is getting written by Steve Orlando. And for hundreds of years, scholars and heroes alike, they have searched for the complete text of the Dark Hold, the book that was written by the Elder God, Cthon, and with one of the greatest sorcerers in all of history to find that book, Cthon has found him as well, and so it's going to take a team of heroes to go and save the day in other realm. And with that being said, Let's dive into this breakdown. Alright gang, so we are picking up underneath the United States in Abysmia. And deep down here, we have individuals digging. And they have been digging, working for one sorcerer in particular. And as they do their digging, they find the book, the Cthon Scrolls. And with this book's discovery, we see a vision of the future. A vision of the possibility that could come now that the true Darkhold has been discovered. And what we see as a vision of absolute chaos. The world descended into absolute madness. With our heroes doing everything they can to defend Earth. But if Cthon rises, we would see the fall of everything. And as this vision comes to an end, this is where we see the Scarlet Witch, Wanda, awakes from her sleep. With this just being a nightmare, she realizes that this means the Darkhold has been discovered. That it will only be a matter of time before that nightmare becomes a reality. Because she knows now, with that vision, that Cthon is on his way. And picking back up underneath the United States, we have Victorious, kind of the second in command for Doctor Doom. And as they are sitting here having minions read the book, because whoever reads it goes mad. So of course, Doctor Doom isn't going to read it directly. And at least that's what we're presuming as of right now. But what we do learn is that the Elder God Cthon, he stripped his own brother's flesh, recorded his work, and for that he was banished to other realms. And with the other gods filling Cthon's book with wards against him, the pages were copied to stone and then to parchment, and we now know it as the Darkhold. But in the midst of this conversation, this is where we see the Scarlet Witch descend upon them, letting them know that whoever does read this book, they go mad, telling them that they cannot control this book, the only one who can is the Scarlet Witch. And we see a fight break out between Victorious and Scarlet Witch. And we see the Scarlet Witch just completely wrecking her. Now believing that this is this should be impossible because she has the power cosmic. Believing that it could not be quilled by her. Yet that is exactly what is happening. And she really tries to talk some sense to her. Tries to let her know that she knows of all people how Doctor Doom can bend people to his will, and that there is no need for either of them to fight. But this is where she gets interrupted by Doctor Doom himself, saying that they may have had relations, they may have known each other at one point in time, but she does not know Doom. And Scarlet Witch, she immediately demands to know what Doctor Doom is up to, why he has dug this book up, and what point is there to it? Knowing the danger, why would you do something like this? And in Doctor Doom's eyes, danger is power. And there can only be one steward of power. And of course, that's Doctor Doom himself. Believing that his duty as a leader is to be the one who controls the Darkhold. And Scarlet Witch tries to let him know, like, you haven't felt that god's touch. You haven't felt Cthon possess you. Because what you just did... It opened up a path for him to come directly to Earth. But Doctor Doom sees it as taking away the one key that anybody has control over Cthon. By taking that key to his freedom, with Cthon being a rival in his eyes. And in the normal Doctor Doom fashion, he tells her that, you know, this conversation is over. I gave you this moment because of who you are. Because of how we know each other. But that moment has now passed, and you're gonna get the freak out of my way. 
And of course, Wanda, this just infuriates her because the quote unquote time they spent together was her powers being stolen. And even then, Dr. Doom, he couldn't be able to, to control all of that, telling him that the true power of the Darkhold is something he will never be able to maintain, something he could never control. That reading just the first page would drive any living individual completely mad. But Dr. Doom, being Dr. Doom, always has a trick up his sleeve. And he reads this text through his Doom bots. And this is where she realizes that it was Dr. Doom. Dr. Doom is the one that awoke in him, that awoke this god. That that nightmare she saw, that was a tainted nightmare that he sent through another dimension to show that the path has now been opened. That Cthon now has a way of making his way to Earth. And the only choice they have now is to stop him, to stop his escape from other realm. And Scarlet Witch gives Doctor Doom an ultimatum, saying that they are now bonded in this together, and he only has two options. He can suffer the reign of Cthon, or they can work together and they can bring him down. Because if he can read the true text of the Darkhold, that means he absolutely has the means of doing this. And Doom tells her that he has also been suffering from visions, and that he agrees with her. And he brings her to a vibograph. They use this vibrational technology to surveil the surface, more or less being able to listen through rock. But Dr. Doom, he is using this to be able to pierce dimensions, not just stone. And with the true Darkhold, he will use it more or less as a lodestar. And so as they begin to read the book, Dr. Doom reads it and Scarlet Witch, she interprets it, trying to find some kind of way of being able to defeat this god, to be able to keep him in other realm. And as they read through this, they learn of the Darkhold Defenders. Five warriors who once drove this god back into his other realm prison. They had the Dreamer, the Fool, the Stoic, the Hunter, and the Artist. These five defeated him for a time, but in entering other realm, it cost them their sanity. And Scarlet Witch, thinking that maybe a divining spell could reform such a group, or they could get a modern team with the same magical aspects, thinking that this could be their best shot against Cthon. But even if they could do something like this, the cost of it could cost them their sanity. Now, as Scarlet Witch goes on about what they need to prepare for, Dr. Doom, he, he's just like, I'm going in. I'm ready to do this. I don't need any five members. I don't need a team. This god has no idea what he is about to face. And we see Dr. Doom take the Darkhold over to his machine, placing it on the machine. We see an electrical charge come out of the book, letting the Scarlet Witch know that she need not worry that Dr. Doom will take care of this god, and that Doom will come to Cthon. And just like that, Dr. Doom is teleported to Other Realm. And of course, Victoria, she wanted to go with him, or at least prevent him from going. But with him being himself, not listening to anybody or anything, Scarlet Witch and Victorious, they think it's a good idea to form this team, the Darkhold Defenders. And with her having the power cosmic, she has the ability to bring all five of these individuals here. And through a seeking spell, they find each of the individuals that is going to help them along the way. The first one is Iron Man, aka the Dreamer. The second one is Blade, aka the Hunter. The next one is Wasp, aka the Artist. The next one being Black Bolt, the Stoic. And last but not least, we have Spider-Man, aka The Fool. And we see them all teleported here by Victorious. In a flash, in one instant, every single one of them are standing before Scarlet Witch. And without wasting any time, she has come to let them know, bringing them all together here, that one of her greatest fears is about to come to fruition. That Cthon is rising again. Not only is he rising, but he is rising in his strongest form yet. In his complete form. That's why all of them are here. And she lays everything on the table. 
laying out the madness that will occur if they end up in other worlds, or the possibility of losing sanity, that he has always needed some kind of vessel like the Scarlet Witch to be able to use the true Darkhold, and with it being un unearthed today by Doctor Doom, and with Doctor Doom racing off to go do battle in other realm, they have a lot going on right now. Now the Scarlet Witch, she knows that Doctor Doom, he's going to get chewed up and he is going to be spit back out. And so they need the defenders. They need the Darkhold defenders. And so with them all knowing the risk, with them all knowing what is at stake, one by one, they make the decision if they are going to join or not. And for the most part, everybody is on board. Everybody except for Black Bolt. Because Black Bolt, he's been doing a lot of work with the Inhumans. And he feels like this work is just too important. It's too important to walk away and risk losing his sanity. Risk never returning to the Inhumans. And because of that, he has to decline this offer. But as he says this, we see a giant energy blast hit right in the middle of the room. And as this blast hits the ground, we see none other than Doctor Doom making his return. But with Doctor Doom returning, he is not in good shape. He is badly melting all over the place. The jaw in his mask has been completely removed and it looks like he got a freaking beat down. And as everybody stares at him, they want to know what the heck happened over in Other Realm. What happened to Doom? Over there, he saw a pulverized metropolis of madness where no moral had any standing. No one sane was walking the lands. And upon arriving there, he just got overwhelmed, completely outnumbered. We saw them start to rip him to pieces. But of course, Dr. Doom, he's not going to divulge any information to them, saying that anything he saw over there, anything that he learned over there, is all for his eyes only. And he lets all of them know that Cthon made a huge mistake leaving him alive. Because now being alive, considering everything that happened, that Victorious is going to stay behind to be able to aid them in their endeavor, saying that it is going to be an inevitable fail, that they will not survive this. And when Cthon does make his way to Earth, Doom is going to be standing ready, having his defenses built up. And after realizing that Dr. Doom got his butt freaking whooped, all of the team starts to recognize the severity of the situation. And so Black Bolt, he's convinced by this and the others to join this team. And so the Scarlet Witch tells them that they all need to read from the Dark Holds, but to be careful not to read too much, because if they do read too much, they will go insane. They need only enough to temper themselves with some madness. And as each one of these individuals, they take their turn reading from the book, they look around at each other, not seeing any difference, not feeling anything different. But all in one moment, that changes. Something changes inside of them. And Scarlet Witch, she realizes that they read too much. They read too deeply. And they let her know, you know, you wanted the Darkhold Defenders. But what did you expect to happen? Because instead of the Defenders, what you were getting is the Darkhold Defiled. Alright gang, so as we dive into this one shot, we are picking up with Black Bolt currently having memory issues. His head with an aching pain, something feeling like lightning going through his mind. Now he can't really remember what is going on, he can't really seem to remember anything at this point. More specifically, he has no idea where he is. But as he looks around at all of the vegetation, he starts to figure out that he is on the moon known as Taros. And with him having the answer to where, now he has to ask how and why. Because right now, the throne for Inhumans, it's since empty, and if Black Bolt doesn't get back soon, he worries that something very bad might happen. And as Black Bolt sits here and tries to get some of his memories back, he gets glimpses of what happened. Picking up earlier at the Royal Palace, Telegard comes up to him in an absolute panic. Telegard being the royal physician, letting him know that his brother Maximus, that his duty compels him to tell the majesty that Maximus is planning a coup. And as he thinks about his brother, his brother Maximus, tyrannical, deceitful, very ruthless, 
forever the single greatest threat to Black Bolt's reign. And the moment the physician spoke his name, he knew this to be true. He knew that Maximus was definitely planning something behind his back, devising some kind of ploy to take over the throne. And he asked the physician for his assistance, saying that he refused to do this, but if he came to him, he surely came to others. But Black Bolt, he has to ask himself, if he was given a warning, then how did he wind up here? How was he betrayed? How could he so easily had stepped into a trap? Now with him traversing this moon, he quickly realizes that there are going to be many threats out here. One of those threats is being a desert kraken. And they know of this because in humans, they don't just execute prisoners. They banish them. The most dangerous of criminals are sent to this moon. And as Black Bolt sits here and battles with this Kraken, letting us know the thing about silence is that when you have been quiet your entire life, when you have been training forever to control your voice and control your abilities, sometimes you forget that you have a voice. And with that, we have a huge power blast coming out of him, turning this Kraken into absolute Swiss cheese. And with the sun rising, with the defeat of the Kraken, he sees the mountaintop, the mountain of survivors, the sole supply point for the entire moon, thinking maybe if there is anybody still loyal to him, there may be a way out of this hell. And so as he makes his journey to the mountain, this is when lightning hits him again, metaphorically speaking, because this is memories coming back to him, where the physician is telling Black Bolt that Maximus he wanted a surgery, molecular surgery, to change his appearance, to make him an exact copy of one of his ministers. Not sure which one it would be, he's doing this in an attempt to take power from him. And with the disguise, he would be able to take out Black Bolt and the entire council. Now Black Bolt, he thinks to himself, this is an absolute crazy scheme. Even for Maximus, it is to the extreme. But at the end of the day, Black Bolt is still stuck here on this moon. So while it may be a crazy plan, something about this plan, it went right. And with him trying to do everything he can to focus on just climbing up this mountainside, his head is throbbing because these memories are just flooding back to him. Now Telegar, he had updated the council on the brother's plot to infiltrate the palace and take out everybody. And if this were true, if Maximus was able to get molecular surgery, that means he could be anybody on the council. And this makes the council all start to panic. This makes them start to all accuse each other without any actual evidence at all. And slowly, one by one, the council is turning on one another, recognizing that this could be part of his plan to divide and conquer the council. Having this information out there, that itself is very damaging. It breaks up the trust of this council itself. But this is when we are told that the science ministry, they have developed something that might be able to help them out here. Something that could prove who is who. Thinking that this technology was going to be the end all be all to this conversation, Black Bolt now looking back feels ashamed that he didn't know better because he should have. They all should have known better because even from the earliest of days, Maximus had always been jealous of Black Bolt. Even though he had everything, the one thing that he wanted was the power that Black Bolt has. But at the same time, Black Bolt, he would gladly give that power up to his brother because he loves him, because he cares about him so much he would have gladly given that power if it didn't come with such a heavy and great cost. He loves his brother too much to put this curse on him. And so with our council members coming into a room, we're introduced to a machine that can show us somebody's memories. And what it does is shows random memories of all who approach it. And so even if Maximus takes on the appearance of someone in this council, the memory detector will expose them. And so immediately, they have this installed in the palace, all in the hopes of finding out who Maximus is and bringing his coup down to an end. Now on the moon, Black Bolt has made his way atop this mountain. Getting up here, he sees that there are supply bins that have been dropped in. 
no one being allowed to land on the planet. They airdrop these supply bins in, and looking to appear like they have come recently, there is a good probability that he is going to be stuck here for quite some time. Now inside of these supplies, there is a burial bag, a self-used burial shroud. The idea is that you put yourself inside of it, and when you seal it, there is no unsealing it. This isn't saying that you are ensuring your fate, saying that you are dead and you are ready to have your body come and picked up. This will signal to the others and let them know to come pick up the body. Now he thinks maybe that he could stay in there long enough, but he worries that he might suffocate before they arrive. And so he rather sit here and just wait, wait for fate to come knocking. And he can't help but think to himself that Maximus, his own brother, did this to him. More than anything, he is thinking about what he is going to have to do once he is finally off of this world. And taken back to a flashback, we see when he was first let out of containment. When Black Bolt came into the world, his brother greeted him. They had such a great love for one another, or at least by all appearances, that's what it looked like. And Black Bolt thinking back, saying that they could have been a family. They could have had everything in the world. But Maximus's lust for power destroyed any hopes of that ever happening. And with Black Bolt sitting here, looking at the sunrise, this is where he hears a noise. An aircraft comes flying in. Now this aircraft, it is not a supply craft. Having the princely insignia on it, he can only think, that this is Maximus, possibly coming down here to gloat, or to ensure that he has not escaped yet. Maybe to get a closer look at his new prize animal that he is keeping in this open air prison. Apologizing for what he must do, Black Bolt hollers out, Maximus! And with this power, the ship comes flying down out of the sky. Coming down and having a crash landing, Black Bolt makes his way over there, going in and opening up the cockpit. This is Talagar, not being able to speak to him, thinking to himself, what has he done? But Talagar tells him that he has failed the prince, wishing that that had been Maximus up there, wishing that he could tell him that none of this was his fault that he shouldn't be responsible or feeling responsible for what has transpired. That he should have known Maximus would betray them. But Telegar lets us know that once his treachery had been discovered, he was forced to flee. He came to take Black Bolt and get out of here. But that obviously is not going to happen now because Telegar is now on his deathbed. Now there's a lot that Black Bolt he still doesn't remember yet. But this is where our good physician he fills in all of the blanks that have been missing so far. Because this, this is not Black Bolt. This is Maximus. Telegar letting him know that they planned this a couple years ago. With Maximus seizing his family, forcing him with threat of death for his entire family if he did not do what he needed to. To help him do this coup all the way until completion. And only then would his family be surrendered. Now he told the real Black Bolt a false version of the overall plot. Telling him that he would be disguised as one of the ministers. And this was all in the hopes that it would paralyze any of their paranoia. They would, they would start suspecting one another. And because of that they wouldn't come together to defend the real Black Bolt when the memory machine revealed the truth. Because that, that was the stick in their plan. They had not prepped for that. They had no knowledge of this technology being on the verge of creation. And because of it, it truly did disrupt all of their plans. The years of planning. Although they made the transformation 100% complete. Now he wasn't able to give him flight. But what he was able to do. He was able to give him the voice. Using the mist. It gives him the power that Black Bolt has. And so by most accounts. This looks like a spitting image of the king. Now learning of this memory detector. They had to be able to fool it. They had to find a way around it. It was necessary to implant false memories memories 
to simulate the memories of his brother. And that is why he currently thinks that he is Black Bolt. And he goes on to tell him that he could have refused. He should have known what would happen, that this could have resulted in some kind of madness. So to fool the memory detectors, he had to give him a, an entire lifetime of memories. But he also had to erase all of his memories, all of Maximus's memories. So in a way, he technically killed Maximus. Or at least temporarily, saying that the true memories, they will come back one day, but this has never really been done before, so they have no idea when that'll be. It could be days, it could be weeks, it could be years, it could be decades before any of his memories come back. The only issue is, he couldn't fight his instincts to speak. Unlike his brother, he hadn't actually spent a lifetime practicing silence, training his vocal cords, denying the instincts to cry out. And so with one shriek, he nearly brought down the entire laboratory. And with the forces coming descending onto the laboratory, Maximus had been captured. With Telegar barely being able to slip away, the plot comes down to a failure. And with that, we have his dying breath saying he did everything he could to help his prince. And having this knowledge, he has to sit here and think about all of this, contemplating on the ideas, thinking that the coup would not be complete until he believed that he was Black Bolt. Or on the opposite side of that, until he, Black Bolt, believed he was Maximus, thinking maybe this was the plan all along, not to steal his identity for himself, but to simply rob him of his own. And so Maximus, no longer knowing whether he is himself or he is his brother. All he does know is if he is Maximus, he can never return. And if he is Black Bolt, he cannot stay here. Not knowing who he was or what to do, he takes the time, the only option that is afforded to him by fate right now. He sits here and he waits. As the beacon goes off with Telegar inside of the body bag. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we get a little bit of a history lesson. Finding out two years ago, the vampire terrorist known as Deacon Frost had offered himself up to the ancient blood demon known as La Magra, annihilating himself and unleashing the V-Wave. This wave, it turned billions of humans instantly into vampires. With millions being turned under daylight, we saw all of them burn. And when it comes to our superhumans, they were transformed, becoming either human or vampire, all by random chance or unholy design. All of the AIs go blank. The gods of men were banished. There are no more mutants or inhumans or eternals. There are only two races on this earth, the fanged and the food. And that's what drops us into New York City and we see Amadeus Cho. Now he is seen as the good vampire, and right now he is being hunted down by individuals that are working for the vampire known as Fisk. But little do they know, they are quickly met by the Blade of the one and only Daywalker. And we see Blade make quick work of all the vampires surrounding him. And with one of them trying to crawl away, saying that he is only a familiar, that he is still human, Blade absolutely does not care. And we see him gun down this dude right here. Now going and looking for Amadeus, he is found in an alleyway. And right now he is absolutely terrified. Because if Blade is out here killing human beings, what chance does he stand at being a vampire no matter how good he claims he is. But in that moment, we see a red smoke take over the area. With this smoke, we see Amadeus disappear and Blade is left standing there wondering where he went. And so with Blade heading back to the house, heading back to home base, he is running low on his serum. The serum that keeps him in check from becoming the blood-hungry vampire that is inside of him. Not only that, on the radio, we are hearing the nationwide news. With daylight vigils, Dracula having total supremacy over the European government. And it has been over 600 days since anybody has heard from Krakoa. 
and then the East Coast Territory known as the Bleed, which stretches all the way from Atlanta to New York City and is run by the undisputed Vampire King of New York known as Mayor Fisk. Now this is where we pick up and Amadeus is being interrogated, trying to find out what information he might have, because he was working for Fisk. And what he tells us is that he is losing control. Now he had grabbed Amadeus after V-Day happened, and he grabbed him so that he could convince him to build some kind of tech for him, in exchange for blood. Now of course he did this without question, so he could get some free blood, but he's smart enough to understand exactly what he is building and then he changes the subject to talk about blade a little bit because blade he's a hunter of vampires and mayor fisk he le he lets this unchecked and that's because having a boogeyman out there it's good for business it helps him maintain the need of protection and there has always been some kind of balance but something has changed blade is not your friendly vampire hunter anymore the serum that is supposed to keep him from going full blood guzzler, it's been running low. Medicine just isn't a priority for a vampire society. But Amadeus' running theory is that he's been burning through it way too fast. And the question rises, what if Lamagra did find a host? One with all of the strengths and only one weakness, that being humanity. Now vampire's eyes, they are normally pink, but supposedly Lamagra when it is in control, your eyes are slow glowing red. But Blade, he is hunting something entirely different. What he is hunting is what Fisk had made. Because Fisk, he had Amadeus make the cure. Fisk has a cure for vampirism. Now the people that took Amadeus, we find out that they are the last Avengers. Silver Sable, Prowler, and Citizen V. And so the last Avengers, what they want to do is to be able to get into Fisk Lair. They need to get in there and try to steal this cure. This could change the course of all of history. And so we see Amadeus go into Fisk Tower, going inside, saying that Fisk has been waiting for him. Now Fisk is a very paranoid individual, only having one elevator that goes up to his penthouse. Now while Amadeus is going up the elevator, we have another empty elevator shaft that Amadeus knows about. One that is out of commission. And so the last Avengers, they use this as an opportunity to go in under stealth. And so while Amadeus makes his way to the penthouse, as the last Avengers are doing their sneaking up the elevator shaft, we have Blade coming in through the main entrance. And the vampire that is supposed to be guarding the front door, sitting at the desk, realizing that this is Blade that just walked in the door, knowing that he is absolutely screwed. And he says, you know, this is probably the coolest way that he could ever hope to actually go out. Now up in the penthouse, Amadeus is sitting here with Fisk a giant fat blob of a person at this point, or vampire if you will. And right now all he is trying to do is to buy a little bit of time to allow the last Avengers to make their way up the elevator. But little do they know, the elevator has been put back into operation. Mayor Fist had this done in case this situation were to arise. Probably finding out ahead of time that they were already on the way, we see the elevator coming up the shaft, vampires on top of it, and now the last Avengers, they are on a mad dash to get to the top. And as things look like they're about to go sideways for Amadeus, this is when Silver starts flowing into the room. And that is because Blade is making his entrance. And this is when Fisk realizes that Blade isn't trying to be noble anymore. Gassing them like they are rats. Blade is finally seeing the light. Because there are no more heroes at the end of the world. Now Amadeus, he was able to use a wet rag to be able to block the Silver from going into his lungs. And Blade finds him hiding inside of the closet, but this is where he is met by Citizen V. Our last adventure comes running in here and tries to battle with Blade. Now at this point, everybody is under the assumption that Lamagra is under control. That Blade has the demon god inside of him. And as Citizen V tries to do everything he can to take on Blade, he just isn't a match for him. At the end of the day, he is only a human. 
and with Blade defeating him, we find out who he really is. Though he goes by the name of Wagner, that is his real name, and because of his accent, that is why he has a V attached to his name. But Blade knows him as Nightcrawler. That is, before the dark magics erase mutant kind yet again. It was nighttime when the wave had hit Krakoa, half of them turning into humans and the other half turning into something that was ready to feast on their own family. With Nightcrawler only having a matter of seconds to teleport himself away into the middle of the ocean, that is before he turned into a human. Recognizing what happens, he made his way to shore, he took on a new identity and he started a new life, and he became someone who could avenge all of those that needed it. And while he's telling this story, we have Amadeus trying to sneak up on Blade, but Blade turns around, grabs him by the throat, Amadeus trying to tell him to fight the demon, that there is a hero still inside of him, and that they are the good vampires. But the reality is, there is nobody inside of there except for Blade, and he has come to the conclusion that there is no such thing as a good vampire. And he takes Amadeus and he throws him out the penthouse window. Standing at this window, because Blade, while sharpening himself into the weapon the world needed him to be, that was until the day the monsters had won. Because a world that is already lost doesn't need any protectors. What it needs is a king. And so Blade tells them to spread the word, because from here on out, every last drop of blood in this city, in this world, it all belongs to Blade. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, it's really more of a Halloween special, Tales of Suspense if you will. A story written by Ryan North. We have a story that is narrated by Pepper, and she brings us back to her beginning. And this specific story, it starts with Iron Man's return back to civilization. Inside of Stark Industries, we have Tony Stark inside of this really crass, early development stage of his suit. Hooked up to the system, it looks like there is something horribly wrong with Tony. As Pepper and Happy both make their way into the room, they find an unconscious Tony Stark. Being able to get the helmet off of him, they're trying to figure out what's going on, and he divulges the truth, the truth that he has shrapnel inside of his bloodstream, and without this arc reactor, without it being able to prevent any kind of shrapnel reaching his heart, he would die from it. And so right now, this machine is the only thing keeping him alive. And they need not worry, because the only thing he was doing is giving, him, giving himself a good charge up. And of course, Tony Stark, he's looking beat up. He just came back from the cave. He is just getting back to civilization. But he goes frantically working on his computer because he wants to make this suit better. He knows it can be better. He knows that it can be more armor than it is weapon. And he tells both Pepper and Happy that he's fine. That currently, right now, he needs space to work. He's an inventor, and that's exactly what he is going to do. He is going to make this suit the best thing the world has ever seen. He is going to create a suit that is going to help save the world. Though he tells everyone to go home, Pepper, Happy, and the butler Jarvis, they all stay behind. Because as long as Tony is here working, they are not going to leave his side. And with Pepper passing out, going to sleep for a little bit, we have Iron Man walk into the room, asking if she's awake, asking if, if she can help him with some of this programming and so on and so forth. But more importantly, he has come to show the developments that he has made so far. And as he takes the helmet off of his head, we see that there are no abrasions, there's no cuts, there's no bruises. It appears that Tony Stark has healed magnificently overnight. And almost instantly, Pepper can tell that there is a huge change in him. The Tony Stark that she once knew, the Tony Stark that she had fallen in love with, although it is secret at this time, he has finally come back. His personality is finally sparking again. The person she remembers is really starting to come to the surface. And what Tony Stark has created is a kind of mobile hospital. Putting yourself inside of this suit, it's going to heal any issues you have. From broken bones to cuts, internal organ bleeding, whatever the case may be, this suit has been designed to heal you up. 
to be the perfect armor because when he was in that cave he really had an epiphany he was stuck there dying and he knew that he wanted to find ways to be able to stay alive to never have to worry about death again and the sole purpose of this machine of this suit is to keep him alive to keep him safe no matter what the cost and he, he expresses that he wants her to investigate look at his hand because he had three fractures just in his hand alone but when they go to take this gauntlet off of him we see that the skin is completely exposed we're seeing muscle we're seeing blood tissue this is not how it should be and with this coming off he is in unbearable pain and they work frantically to get that gauntlet back on getting the glove back onto his hand almost immediately he is feeling better again and almost instantly he's right back to his normal personality saying that it's simply got a few bugs that they need to work out now of course both pepper and happy they're a little freaked out right now his skin had just come off when he took off the gauntlet that's obviously not a good side effect it's obviously something that they don't want happening but Tony Stark, he reassures them that he's going to be able to fix this, that it's just a minor bump in the road. Now, with his confidence hugely risen, Pepper says that she, she looked up all the information that might be useful last night, and she wants to stay, work side by side with him, and try to figure out how to make his skin come back, how to make it regenerate. Because the suit, it didn't take his skin per se, but it really, it believed that iron skin was definitely more stable, more protection, and so human flesh is just incomparable and completely useless. So he has to get back into the algorithm, try to fix it to where the suit doesn't take his skin, but just regenerates it. And so Pepper and Tony Stark, they work side by side, working late, late into the hours, losing complete track of time. But Pepper Potts is completely engulfed in his amazement. She is completely invigorated by him. And while Tony Stark, he goes through how he, he wants to be a hero, that he wants to be able to help people, that being in that cave, it truly made him realize just how ungrate of a person he was. Not only that, but he realized he was alone, that he never recognized those around him, the people that cared about him, the people that love him. And this is where we see a very charged embrace between Pepper and Tony. An embrace that leads to them kissing for the first time. And though things may start to look like they're getting a little hot and heavy, he's still completely encased in an iron suit. So there's not much they can do here. And so while they share this moment, while they finally express their feelings for one another, there's still a task at hand. They still need to take care of getting him out of this suit without his flesh ripping from his body. And so they go their separate ways, working in two separate areas, trying to multitask and make it to where they can, they can get this done faster. And before they know it, night turns to morning. With Jarvis coming in with morning breakfast, we hear Iron Man shout that he is coming down the hallway. And as everyone gets ready to eat some food, we see Tony Stark walk in, but something is vastly different about him. Both Pepper and Jarvis looking at Tony in complete disgust and awe. Because right now, Tony Stark is inside the suit, but it appears that his skin is melting out of all the seams. As if it is being pushed out of the suit. And at this point, Tony has no idea what is going on. He can't feel any of this happening. He wasn't even seeing it happen. Not even recognizing that he put the full suit back on. Thinking that the, this must have happened subconsciously. That he didn't even remember doing it. And as they start to do some scans, Pepper lets him know that his skin is gone. His skin has completely dissolved. And so right now... If they remove this armor, there is a 100% chance that Tony Stark will die from it. And obviously being concerned, Tony Stark looks dead in her eyes and asks her, why would I ever want to take this suit off? Now he tries to play this off as a joke, but there was some very big sincerity in his words. We can see that this suit is changing him. Something about it being connected to his, his psychological. This algorithm is truly affecting him. He's more or less appearing to create an Ultron in himself. Now telling them not to worry, to not freak out, that this is just a minor mishap. That he can easily fix this, he just needs some time. And we see him sit down at the computer and he starts typing away. Letting them know that he needs a few items. That they both need to go grab them real quick. 
and while he's working on this, they should be able to fix this relatively quickly. And as Pepper and Jarvis come back into the room, Tony Stark initiates the isolation protocol and we see huge glass walls come slamming down and this is all the time that Tony Stark had needed because this suit has started to change him change him into someone else into something else now from the outside Pepper can still run a scan of his body to try to figure out what is going on before it's too late before Tony Stark does something that he's going to hugely regret. Obviously knowing that there is something wrong with him, she goes to the computer screens, and she tells Tony that whatever is happening to him, it's accelerating. That there are wires from the suit deep inside of his brain. That his skull has completely gone, and he'll never be able to leave this suit again. And looking through this glass, there is no emotion on Tony Stark's face. A complete calm, is over his body and the only thing he says is that that sounds fine to him and we see tony stark start to slowly walk away from pepper with tears in her eyes seeing the man she loves slowly turn into this frankenstein of a monster with him being completely content with this algorithm con completely taking him over and making him complacent in everything going on he goes over to the computers and he says that he needs to work. Kicking the building into absolute lockdown. All of the doors shut. Lines cut themselves. Nobody can reach Tony Stark. All they can do is sit there and wait. Now with not much time passing, we see the lab unlock. With it unlocking, both Jarvis and Happy, they go in to investigate. To find out what is going on. But it only unlocks temporarily. We see the glass come slamming down and both Happy and Jarvis are trapped. With the fire suppression system going online, all of the oxygen is sucked out of the room. And as Pepper watches on a monitor, she sees exactly what Tony Stark has been up to. He has been working and creating more of these suits. And he is using Happy and Jarvis as his next guinea pigs. With them both unconscious, he grabs them and throws them into these newly constructed suits. In a matter of seconds, you start to hear bones snap. You see both men start to gush out of every crease in this suit. And when it's all said and done, they sit there motionless until a few moments later, they start moving to help Tony Stark. Now Pepper, she is trapped inside of this building, having no way to access any way out of here, being so high up, the only thing she can do is simply sit here and watch as all of this transpires. And looking outside, we see that Tony Stark is down on the ground, inside of his suit, telling everybody that this suit is the suit of the future. Whatever ailments you have, it will save you. It will heal you. It will protect you. You never need anything else. And while Pepper, she throws a chair out the window, tries shouting to everybody to not get in the suits, they can't hear her. And one by one, she hears people getting into suits, thinking that maybe he was only able to make a couple. She is hearing dozens and dozens of people screaming, bones crunching, and then absolute silence. And as she sits up here, crying her eyes out, knowing that there is nothing she can do, nothing she can do to stop Tony Stark and what is about to transpire, on the rest of the world, watching as the man she loves become this hideous, horrible monster. And from behind her, this is where we see Tony Stark. Tony Stark grabbing a hold of her and telling her that it is time. And as they walk into Tony Stark's laboratory, we see a suit designed especially for Pepper. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up and the world it definitely looks a lot different than we recognize. But we have a conversation between Gwen Stacy and Peter Parker. Gwen just letting Peter know that on his way home, he needs to grab some vinegar, he needs to grab some other items. Being on the phone, today is an anniversary. It appears to be their anniversary. But as Peter is swinging through the city, we see that the city, it, it looks like it is being held together. And the bond that is holding everything appears to be Spider-Man's webbing. And Peter goes on to let us know that Manhattan, the place that once was a concrete jungle, full of noise, never having a moment of silence, Manhattan is now quiet as a mouse. And that is because of the unraveling. 
and the unraveling has taken over all over the city. Spider-Man not knowing why it happened or even how it happened, no one knows at this point. Reed Richards saying that it might have had something to do with the Molecule Man. But even then, Spider-Man believes that he might be reaching on that. All they truly know is that one day, everything began to fall apart. Bridges, buildings, even people started to fall apart. And that's where Spider-Man's webbing comes into play. The only trouble is that his webbing, it doesn't last that long. Only being able to hold individuals together for about three hours, Spider-Man has to make his way across the city all day long trying to keep everything together. And with him having to go all across the city trying to piece together everyone he can and keep them whole, people are going to slip through the cracks. Individuals will slip through the cracks and we have one guy right here in front of him who he is trying to piece together but it looks like he is missing pieces. His jaw is missing and one of his arms is missing. And what Spider-Man lets us know is that Dr. Octopus had tried to take him hostage. And this is not the first attempt. So it appears that there may be a few individuals out there that are still able to, to operate outside of the unraveling. The saddest part of all of this is that everyone is aware of what is happening. They watch as they slowly fall apart. But Spider-Man, he goes looking for Dr. Octopus. Having this guy's arm, believing that he had taken a hostage. But the fact of the matter is, he only grabbed an arm. And Doc Ock, he is definitely affected by the unraveling. Spider-Man has been doing everything he can to try to keep him together. And while he is definitely stronger some, than some other individuals out here, him still being able to move and go about, if he does it for too long or too much, he begins to break apart himself. But what's remaining of his brain, what is left of his mental state goes back to the one thing he knows. He hates Spider-Man and he is going to make him pay. And so every single day, Spider-Man is having to continue this loop over and over and over again. And for Peter Parker, this comes down to just pity. He pities everyone so much, even Dr. Octopus, that he will come back through here, he will fight him real quick, put him back together, and do it all again the next day. But with Dr. Octopus now being put back together, we see a flare go up into the sky. A flare that looks very familiar. As if Johnny Storm himself had wrote it, there is a flaming four up in the sky. And so taking us to the Baxter building, we are picking up with Spider-Man coming in and letting Reed Richards know that he doesn't need to send a flare up. That there is no reason for it, he could simply just let him know that he needs him. And Reed Richards, he is currently indisposed. And when I say indisposed, he turns himself into a, a just blob of a human being. Because he discovered that abandoning human morphology, it frees up significant cognitive capabilities. And so this is just, it really allows him to work better. It allows his mind to work even harder when his, his body isn't focused on all of his muscle groups, his nervous system, everything else going on. When his body is not focused on that, he can redirect all of his energy directly into his mind. Now Reed Richards, he asked him one simple question. Why do you keep doing this silly anniversary with Gwyn? Every single year you do this insane anniversary meal fantasy. But the truth of the matter is he has a responsibility to the city. With Peter Parker letting him know that he only gets about 3 hours of sleep as it is. That when he is not sleeping, he is out there swinging trying to keep everything together while Reed Richards, for all of this time, has not found anything that can help solve this problem. But there is something that he wants to show Peter Parker. And what he wants to show him is the new replacement that could take over for the webbing. Now he lets him know that his webbing, it degrades over time, approximately 3 hours. And what he is showing him is a self-healing, organic polyer that can theoretically replace all of his web fluid. He applied this special enzyme to make it adhesive. The only thing about it is this is Reed Richards' finger. Now, Peter Parker, he's just like, listen, man, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> Reed Richards telling, telling Peter Parker, like, I'm not delusional, man. Like, trust me, this plan's gonna work. 
I got it. You just have to bring me people that are that are like me, that are like you. Because Peter Parker's accelerated healing is what saved him from the unraveling. And Reed Richards' elastic molecular structure is what stopped him. Believing that there have to be others like him out there. If they can be brought here, they can be turned into an enzyme and it would solve all of the webbing problems. Now Peter Parker, he ignores all of this and he focuses on the sonic gun that is in the corner of the room. Recognizing what that gun is for and knowing 100% why Reed Richards has brought it out. And it's because he is back in town. It is because Venom is in New York City. Now Peter Parker, he is already running a little bit late for his anniversary, or it looks like he is going to be running late. But he has to investigate this Venom situation. Because the truth of the matter is Spider-Man has not seen Eddie Brock ever since the unraveling had begun. Not knowing where he disappeared to, not knowing where he ran to, more than anything, he is concerned that he needs to take the shot and take him down before Venom gets the jump on him. The only thing is, Venom gets the jump on him. With Peter being too slow, being too stupid to recognize he had walked directly into a trap. The only issue is, Peter Parker can still remember his name, which means either Venom is pulling his punches, or there is something wrong with him. And with Peter Parker bringing the ceiling down on both of them, we see the rocks coming down. But Venom stops this fight in mid-fight and lets Peter Parker know that he is not here to brawl with him. Because Eddie Brock, he is dead. Venom showing us his skeleton. Now it hasn't been long and Venom has been doing everything he can to keep Eddie alive and keep his corpse now fresh that he has passed away. Giving everything he can, he simply could not save his life. And Spider-Man tells him, you know, you could have left this place. I don't understand why you stuck around, why you still have Eddie Brock holding on to him. And that's something that, that Peter Parker never understood. He never understood the bond between Eddie Brock and Venom. Two wounds they were, bowed and broken at the same altar, but they healed each other. They made each other better. They were exactly what one another needed. Eddie wasn't simply his host. Eddie Brock was his home. And Peter apologizes to him, lets him know that he is sorry. He is truly, truly sorry for his loss and lets him know that if he is ready to bond to somebody else, that Peter Parker, he knows at one point in time he denied him, but he is ready to take that on now. Only if Venom himself is willing to do so. And while Venom, he thinks about it, he doesn't do it. He sits here in these sewers, holding on to the corpse of Eddie Brock, and he lives inside of his grief. Now this is where Peter Parker, he recognizes that he is running late, needing to get to Gwen as fast as he possibly can. He makes his way across the city, and he gets there just a little bit late. But what we see is Gwen Stacy, the unraveling has affected her as well. She was not spared in this, and this story that had any kind of hope, that is all taken away in a split second. Because what we are seeing is Peter Parker, he is living a life that, that no one should live. This will bring anybody to the brink of absolutely just snapping. Living on three hours of sleep, having the woman he loves in his living room day in and day out, pretending this sick little fantasy that he has of, of some kind of make-believe life that once was. This is the only thing that he has to hold on to. This is the only thing that is stopping his sanity from absolutely collapsing in on itself. But after all of this time, it was only a matter of time before Peter Parker broke. And as he goes to Reed Richards to find out if there's any advancement in what they are doing next, with him trying to apologize to Peter for even bringing up Stacy, even bringing up their whole little anniversary date. But while Reed is sitting here looking through a microscope, Spider-Man comes up from behind him with a needle in hand. Injecting Reed with this, we pick up later on, and what we are seeing is that the unraveling is no longer held in place by webbing, but some kind of blue material. But it gives him some time to think. It gives him some time to mourn. 
This is not an end-all be-all. This is not a, a fix-it-all problem. This is only a temporary solution. This new webbing is definitely not going to fix this city. And we hear the faint whisper of Reed Richards letting Peter know that he wants all of this to end. Telling him that the pain is unbearable. Spider-Man letting him know that he has a responsibility to the city. We see that what he used was Reed Richards. Using Mr. Fantastic as the elastic man himself to be able to hold this city together. And we see that Spider-Man has finally broke. Alright gang, so as we dive into the Wasp issue, we are picking up with Janet and Hank. And right off the bat, we are learning that there, there appears to be some kind of... Not necessarily hostility between the two, but there's a distance. We're seeing Hank not wearing his wedding ring. This is really bothering Janet. Now Hank lets her know that he simply he can't work with his wedding ring on. That it's simply too dangerous. But we can see that this truly affects Wasp. And it's just the little things that she is noticing. But she also understands that every marriage it has rough patches. Every marriage has these moments where not everything is 100%. And so they continue on to their day to day. Now Wasp, she is still currently working on the Avengers team. Hank on the other hand, he is not allowed on the Avengers because of government sanctions. Whatever he has done recently, it has caused them to ban him from the Avengers, at least temporarily. And so picking up with the Avengers, they are currently going against Kang the Conqueror. And it really looks like our Avengers, they have the upper hand. They are throwing Kang around, but Iron Man gets cocky. Thinking he has the upper hand, that changes so very quickly. Because Kang the Conqueror, no matter how great Tony Stark's mind is, no matter how great his technology is, Kang the Conqueror can control it. And using Iron Man as a puppet, Iron Man starts attacking all of the Avengers. And with Kang the Conqueror thinking that he has all of these guys at bay, Coming to steal whatever he is looking for, this is where our tiny little wasp comes flying in. But Kang the Conqueror knows exactly how to get to her. Though she's able to throw in some good punches, he attacks her psychologically because he can feel the resentment that is pouring out of her for Hank. And he uses this to his advantage, bringing up one of his old lovers that lived in Egypt, saying that she reminds him so much of her and that he cared for her. He would go to the ends of the universe to bring her back, to save her life, to do anything he can for her. And so he asked the wasp, who is out there caring for you? And using this trick, this gives Kang the Conqueror the opportunity to escape. And that leaves Janet there questioning everything about her life. Now we pick up a little bit later and we have Janet just bringing Hank some food, bringing him some lunch while he is hard at work in the laboratory. And we can immediately tell that he's on edge, that he freaks out even when she asks the simplest of questions. Now he recognizes he's on edge a little bit, but he lets his anger get the better of him. But Janet's able to really de-escalate the situation and she does that by just telling him how amazing he is how the work he does is just groundbreaking really just hyping him up to the absolute fullest now janet really wants to just spend some quality time with him she even suggests that they go on some kind of vacation just to get away from everything Get away from the laboratory, get away from the Avengers, get away from trying to do everything he can to get back on the Avengers. But he says he's simply too busy, even though he makes up his own schedule, he says he just doesn't have time for her. But Janet really lets him know that they don't need the Avengers, they don't need anybody else. Because as long as they have each other, that is all that they really need. And as she sits there and loves on him and consoles him, she recognizes that his ring is off yet again, and immediately he flips out, tells her not to make a big deal out of it, not to make a fight out of this. And so she says nothing except for I love you, and she walks away. And so we can obviously tell that this relationship is just not doing well right now. It is definitely in a rough patch. She is doing everything she can to show her compassion, her affection, her support for her husband. The issue is, 
He just isn't listening. He's not reciprocating this in any way, shape, or form. And that's what takes us to Avengers Mansion. And right now, everybody is celebrating because Hank is back in the Avengers. With the government lifting whatever restrictions and sanctions that were on him, he is welcomed back with open arms. And we see a conversation between Janet and Pepper. And this conversation is really... It's really Janet just not wanting to talk about her relationship issues, but it's obviously there. That resentment, it's been building up. Well, yes, he's getting everything that he currently wanted. He is still leaving her by the wayside, still absolutely ignoring her in every form of their relationship. And Pepper even brings up the same thing that Kang the Conqueror had brought up. Who is going to take care of you if you're not going to take care of yourself? Now this is when Hank takes on the persona of Yellow Jacket. But things go way different for him. He starts to lose control. And Janet starts to recognize that he is nothing more than a tortured soul. Someone that doesn't necessarily care about him, but only cares about furthering himself. Questioning every day why she should let this continue. Saying that this partnership, it requires a give and take and that simply is not happening anymore and so we can see that all of this it's building up this is all getting to her and she really just doesn't know what to do because at the end of the day she loves hank with everything that she is but she is questioning herself more and more every day if she should stay in this relationship and so picking up a little bit later with wasp and tigra sitting outside of a room waiting for Hank to come out. Right now, having a discussion with the Avengers, these two talk about what is going on with Janet. And this conversation is really just reinforcing everything that we have seen so far. That she's not happy in the relationship, that he may not be like all of the other Avengers, but he is definitely egotistical. He is definitely full of himself. He is definitely narcissistic. And she couldn't imagine being married to any of them let alone someone like Hank. Now she tries her best to defend him, but in the midst of their conversation, Hank comes piling out of the room because he has been kicked off of the Avengers again. Even coming in as Yellow Jacket, they're saying that he is too violent. He is too erratic. He doesn't try to try to stop the situation without violence first. That he goes in guns blazing and that is just too much of a liability for the Avengers to have. Not only that, because of his actions, they are going to make him stand court-martial. And so right now, he is absolutely petrified. And though she embraces him, we see her at night tossing and turning. With Hank never coming to bed, with her all alone, all of this resentment, all of this building up inside of her. It's only a matter of time before something happens. It's only a matter of time before she snaps and cannot take it anymore. But getting up in the middle of the night one night, she goes down to Hank's lab to see what he is up to. Going down there, shrinking down to the size of a wasp. She goes to investigate because he has been frantically working down here for days. And what she sees, it absolutely terrifies her because he is building some kind of ultimate robot. Now Hank sees her and he absolutely freaks out. Believing that she is spying on him, he swats her right out of the sky. With her going pummeling down to the ground, she goes back to regular size. And he yells, he screams at her, saying that he is trying to save his career. As she pleads with him, she begs him to just stop all of this. That they can find some kind of other way. This is where he strikes her. Hitting his wife directly across the face, sending her flying back. Breaking beakers all over her hands, we see blood pouring out of her. Now Hank recognizing that he went way too far. He tries pleading with her, trying to say that he's sorry, that he didn't mean to do it, that he doesn't know what came over him. But this is where we see Janet pick up one of those shards of glass. And this is the moment that Wasp breaks. This is the moment that she cannot take anymore. Taking that glass, she drives it into the chest of her husband. She stabs him once. She stabs him twice. She continues to stab him as blood is spilling out of his body. As he goes lifeless and with her covered in blood, stepping away from the body, she feels 
that she is finally free. All right, gang. So as we dive into the Omega issue of the Dark Hold, we are seeing all five of our Dark Hold defenders. They read too much into the book, and because of this, it has turned them mad. Reading too much out of the book, it has turned them all completely rabid. With the Scarlet Witch trying to let them know that they all need to remember they have come to fight Cthon, but they do not lack the memory. Scarlet Witch is the one that told them to read from the book. And now that they have turned into whatever they are, the Scarlet Witch wants to try to backtrack. With the Scarlet Witch holding them off, throwing the book to Victoria so it can get back to Doom, we see the five defenders trying to take out the Scarlet Witch. With her pleading with them, telling them that this was the only way. They had to be tempered with madness to go into other realms. This was the only way they wouldn't go completely insane once they arrive in Cthon's realm. Using her power and her control of the bands, she is able to lock all of them up. None of them able to move, at least temporarily, while she opens up the portal to other realm. With the portal now open up, she tells her friends to remember, to remember who you are, to remember what you are fighting against. Now Scarlet Witch, she doesn't know the outcome of what will happen to our five defenders. But what she is hoping for is that they are able to weaken him long enough for her to be able to make her attack. And so with our five arriving in other realm, they are quickly met by the previous defenders. Losing in battle, they have been taken over by Cthon. And so Iron Man, Blade, Black Bolt, Spider-Man, and Wasp, they have to take on these defenders. Making quick work of them, they are quickly met by the armies of Cthon. And with Cthon not showing his face, they are going to make him come. And that starts by taking out his army. And what they want to do is kill Cthon and the five of them take over his throne. Be the gods of Otherrealm. Saying that they will deal with Scarlet Witch at a later time. If they take the throne now, the power they will get will be so immense. Otherrealm will become five times worse than it ever was. And it doesn't take long for the five of them to completely lay waste to the entire army. And this was enough to get the attention. The attention of Cthon, with the ground rumbling underneath their feet, with it cracking and breaking into pieces. We see a hand arise, scooping the five of them up, it begins to close down on them. With the wasp growing in size and doing everything she can to stop this hand from squishing all of them. With the power of just being too great. She is unable to hold this for a very long time. But lucky for her, a wandering stranger makes his arrival. Coming in to save the day, a giant blast of energy shoots out in all directions and this stops them from being crushed into the hand none of them having any clue who this individual is not sure where he came from not sure if he is one of Cthon's lackeys blade goes in to make an attack and our stranger knocks him for a freaking loop but before the five of them can take him on the ground starts to rumble and Cthon shows himself with all of the heroes laid out on the ground, with our random stranger completely winded, not having the power in him to fight anymore, expending his power to be able to stop all of the heroes from being squished, Cthon goes to walk through the gateway that will lead him to Earth. The only issue with that is there is a barrier, something stopping him from breaking through. That something is the Scarlet Witch and Victor Von Doom. With Doom holding the Dark Hold, the two of them are about ready to battle Cthon. And with Cthon throwing a huge blast at them, the Scarlet Witch and Doom combining their spells, they are able to protect themselves. And the Scarlet Witch lets him know that the book showed her the true Dark Hold. It cannot be destroyed, and neither can Cthon. And though Earth may have been once his, Doom lets him know, now that he has the book, 
he will embody it. Doom will bind him and seal his revenge. The only thing, it's not his revenge. And we see the Scarlet Witch set Doom ablaze. With him bursting into flames, the Dark Hold is flung out of his hands. And it is caught by the Scarlet Witch. Because after everything that she has been through, after everything her and Cthon have gone through, this revenge belongs to her. And as Cthon goes to take out the Scarlet Witch, we see her grab the book, do a quick spell, and the book is absorbed into the Scarlet Witch. And now she is truly able to fight back. Because the book is the only thing that has real power over Cthon. And now every fiber of that book, every ink drop, it exists inside of the Scarlet Witch. She is the true Darkhold. And so Cthon, being absorbed into the Scarlet Witch, him once possessing her, she now possesses him. And with the Scarlet Witch absorbing Cthon into her, he is now trapped inside this prison. With our five heroes still driven by madness, they go to attack the Scarlet Witch to take all of this for their own. But the Scarlet Witch sending them back to Earth, we see them transform into their regular selves. Because now that she has the book, now that it is contained inside of her, she was able to rewrite the influence it had over all of them. With the Scarlet Witch thanking every single one of them for all of their help. But the question still remains, who was our stranger? Who was the individual that came to help us in other realms? And that's what takes us to Pennsylvania. And we find our wandering stranger, with the wasps coming to let them know that they were happy to have the assist. They are grateful for his help, but the question still remains, who the heck are you? And we learn that long ago, he departed on a dimensional pilgrimage. Being waylaid to other realm, he has sat and observed for all of this time. But this individual's name, is James Michael Starling. This is Omega the Unknown, hailing from the 1970s comics, having a, a revamp back in 2007 timeframe. Omega the Unknown is someone that we have not seen for quite some time. But now being free from other realm, he has made his way back to Earth. Now, meanwhile, in upstate New York, Sitting down having a conversation is the Scarlet Witch and Victor Von Doom. Now obviously Doom at this point, he is furious because he wanted that power. Not only that, the Scarlet Witch set him on fire. But after she had been used by him, she will never be done setting him ablaze. She knew that he would make this about himself. His ego has always been his downfall. Because even in defeat, he still thinks that he is better than the Scarlet Witch. Letting Doom know that he can no longer threaten her. Their feud is locked away with the past. The darkness that she will always carry along with her. This is a new page for the Scarlet Witch. And finally, she is free. And that will be the end of this series. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments. I really have had a lot of fun with this Darkhold run. Most of the story surrounded our individuals reading the book and the what if stories that happened to them. Now of course we saw it was all temporary, everything went back to normal, but these are situations, stories that could happen, and they were in fact left with the memories to remind them of the small changes that could change their course of history forever to change their fate and they could go down a very dark path but what we are learning is the scarlet witch she has become one with the dark hold this makes her one of the most op characters in marvel comics i mean we literally just saw her create a mutant heaven and now she is absorbing the dark hold not sure if this was before or after those events. But regardless, they are making her one of the heaviest hitters to be currently written right now. And so it'll be very interesting to see how they handle her moving forward. 
having all of this power inside of her. All of this chaos magic, the dark hold, everything. We can only imagine that she is going to be seen as a threat by, by a lot of people. Maybe even part of mutant kind themselves. Because it wasn't necessarily said that she was, a, she was accepted back as a mutant. They call her the Redeemer. But we can only imagine people are going to be terrified as she grows more and more powerful. And then you have to worry about how are you going to write someone this powerful and what are you going to put her up against? What threats could be out there that could honestly compete with this kind of power that we haven't seen before? Or are they going to end up nerfing her along the way, taking the power away from her? This leaves us with tons and tons of questions. But if mutant kind could ever use an ally, Scarlet Witch is exactly what they need on their side right now, especially with everything going on in other worlds, everything going on with the moon that circles around Mars. Having Nimrod, having Orcus, all of these things stacked against mutant kind. They need allies like the Scarlet Witch. But let me know what you guys think down in the comments. If you have not yet, do me a favor, hit that sub button, hit that notification bell, make sure you're not missing any of the awesome content we have coming out, and until the next breakdown.